this uh, this workshop is uh, entitled National Internet Governance Mechanisms, looking at some key design issues. Uh, and what we've done is invited uh, uh, people to contribute from a number of uh, internet governance uh, organizations at the national level that reflect, uh, we think, a diversity of strategies towards internet governance. Um, uh, the question of national internet governance uh, is one that is, and the development of appropriate strategies for national internet governance uh, is one that is uh, uh, of, of increasing uh, significance as uh, these mechanisms develop and mature in uh, national organizations as their revenue base increases, as their uh, as the significance of um, uh, the internet increases in uh, the in the whole a variety of countries around the world, uh, and the uh, discussion of the management uh, of the public internet resources and uh, looking at the internet as a public trust, as a public commons, uh, is a, uh, an emerging, uh, is uh, something that's been discussed here today in the initial um, presentations. Uh, and the question of how that public trust is defined uh, and identified uh, at the national level and how it might uh, evolve uh, over time, particularly as the issues of uh, t the management of the technical layer uh, becomes uh, increasingly routinized and the challenges of the uh, participation and management and intervention uh, at the applications and ultimately at the policy level become more, more significant. Um, uh, and equally, the translation of the strategies for multi-stakeholder participation in management, uh, in, in the management at the national level of the internet governance, uh, internet governance um, uh, is one that uh, is uh, uh, more uh, easily adopted or has been more easily adopted uh, in some countries than others uh, and has led to d a variety of different strategies for incorporating the multi-stakeholder, multi-stakeholderism into the management structure. Uh, and that's something we'd like to, uh, like to have presented here. And uh, I see that, uh, I, I believe that there are uh, representatives here from a variety of countries, some of whose um, uh, national internet governance uh, mechanisms may be uh, less mature than others, and so uh, the identification of lessons learned and experience may be of considerable interest. Uh, I should also mention that uh, uh, unbeknownst to us when we submitted this uh, uh, proposal for a workshop, uh, ISOC was quite independently a, a commissioning a couple of studies which I believe are being uh, uh, made public as we speak. Uh, that deal directly with this issue, and I've had a chance to take a quite a good look at them, and I think it's very they're very useful studies because they do uh, provide a lot of the background information, uh, the what of uh, or the approach, how to approach the what of uh, national internet governance, uh, and um, had we known, we could have used them as the background for this discussion because our concerns are. Uh, the more, much more concerned with the, the, um, um, the what for and the why of internet governance, how to of internet governance. So um, I will, uh, uh, I'll just read through the questions that uh, we've asked the panelists to address. I'll deal with them briefly. Uh, how should the national commons of internet resources be managed? Uh, why do you think this is the appropriate strategy for management of these resources at the national level? Uh, what kinds of mechanisms are appropriate for technical matters? What for those that are partly technical and partly social 
and what for larger public policy matters requiring more political responses? Uh, should there be a common single mechanism to address all of the above kinds of issues or different ones? Uh, how should we? How should the uh, different mechanisms be uh, for managing managing these uh, individual uh, matters uh, be coordinated? Uh, and uh, how to coordinate the different parts of the national governance machinery dealing with different aspects of uh, or kinds of internet governance issues. Uh, how to ensure meaningful participation of all stakeholders in a manner that focuses on uh, the public interest. And how or should the surplus from the domain name registration fees etc. collected by the national internet governance agencies be employed for public interest purposes, especially for, for example, taking up internet related research. So it's a big, uh, a, a whole range of topics, and we have some really excellent uh, contributors here. Uh, uh, and we also have uh, Raquel Gatto is uh, our uh, internet moderator who is taking, uh, will be taking questions and comments from the internet. And so I'd like to uh, uh, in in just introduce briefly the uh, panelists. Uh, Byron Holland, who's the CEO of CIRA, the Canadian Internet Registry Author As Association? Association. Registration Authority. Registration Authority. Okay. I should know that. I'm Canadian and I should know that. Uh, typo? Tapani Tasvainen from Electronic Frontier Finland. Uh, and he has a Finnish name, so I can be I, I can be forgiven for having difficulty with it. Sorry, Tapani. Um, Pranish Prakash from the Center for Internet and Society in India. Uh, Susan Chalmers from Internet New Zealand. Uh, Where did you press? Oh, it's alright. Yeah, no. Carlos Afonso from CGI.br. Um, and uh, I believe Fuad Bajwa will, who's actually presenting next door, will also be coming in to talk briefly about Pakistan. So uh, perhaps I'll ask Byron to uh, to kick off. Okay, thank you very much. Um, as mentioned, my name is Byron Holland, and I'm the president and CEO of CIRA. Uh, which is the Canadian Internet Registration Authority, and we're the CCTLD operator for .ca in Canada. We do, uh, just to give you a quick idea of what we do, um, because there are many different ways to organize a, a country code operator, uh, we operate our own registry and DNS operations. So my shop is primarily of engineers, both hardware and software, because we run the registry itself and the underlying DNS infrastructure for .ca, where we have multiple physical nodes across Canada, as well as engage any cast clouds around the world. So we do a lot of operations within our group, but we also do a significant amount of policy work, both domestic and international. So we participate very actively in the ICANN world, uh, as well as here at the IGF, and uh, we'll also be participating at the Wicket. So in terms of the kind of environment that we have at CIRA, um, it's both policy and pure operations. Uh, to give you, I mean, to start to answer some of the questions, it's, it's a pretty wide ranging and hopefully it'll be a very interesting discussion as a result. But when we talk about the national resources and how they're operated in Canada specifically, I think it's pretty fair to say that from a government perspective, uh, the Canadian government has had a very, very light touch in the uh, internet ecosystem in Canada. And that um, I think is important to note because the delegation for .ca and for most country codes flows through the government of the land, as it does in Canada. And in the late 1990s, when um, the, the TLD was being delegated, the government decided in consultation with the community, and this is where it really starts in terms of how we get to where we are today, 
the government of the land had a very open consultation with the internet community, and that was broad-based, both the, in the industry actors, the registrars, who very much at the time wanted to make us an association, and, and it was interesting you sort of used that word to start with, because that is not what happened. We did not become the association of uh, registry or registrar operators. We became the authority, and there is a big difference in those two words. But it was a consultation with the entire community, both industry, civil society, government actors, uh, other actors in the internet ecosystem. And from that was born CIRA, which is a private, not-for-profit corporation. And the government had the opportunity at that time to, in a sense, do as it wished. We could have been an agency of the government. We could have been an arm of the government. We could have been within a department of the government. I mean, there's a whole range of, of, uh, w of organizational types, but the government very specifically chose to create a not-for-profit corporation. A and that's where CIRA was really born. And part of the governance there, and in terms of how do the mechanisms work in Canada, is the actual governance model of CIRA. And while this gets a little bit dry, it is critical to how we in Canada balance the different actors and different parts of the ecosystem. So our board of directors is elected from the internet community. And that allows many different stakeholder types to put forward different candidates or support various candidates um, and, and very much allows all of the actors to make sure that widely representative views are actually reflected on the board. In order to do that, there are a couple of categories, some that have uh, more expertise-based input, so we're looking for people who have maybe specific technical, legal, financial expertise that you need to see the board with, but also straight from the members, so anybody from the internet community, literally, a and we literally do get that on our board, um, can put themselves forward and get elected. And they do, and we have those members on our board. So that actual governance model makes sure that at a corporate level, the actual operation of the organization, we get a wide range of inputs at the most senior level of our organization. And that was very clearly considered uh, at the time of the delegation of the TLD to us. And I think that it's that balance, while it may seem a little esoteric and corporate governance related, was actually critical to finding the balance that allowed the Canadian government to say, no, we will place this in the hands of a private corporation, which at the end of the day, that's what we are. Our tax status is not for profit, but we are a private corporation in terms of uh, the type of entity that we are. But it was that balancing at the board level that allowed the government to have confidence that the entire internet ecosystem's views would be reflected in the behavior of CIRA. So that, that's a bit of background on, on who we are and how we came to be, but also why I think the Canadian government continues to have comfort in the way that we operate. Um, in terms of the overall commons in Canada, we have a number of different actors that play a significant role. We're certainly one of them in the domain space and the pure internet governance space. But we also have uh, an actual agency called the CRTC, Canadian Telecommunications Regulatory Agency. And they handle broadcast and telco and more and more are moving into uh, a, a broadly defined digital space and have made some key decisions purely in the internet space in the last couple of years around net neutrality, around usage-based billing, and other what we would typically consider pure internet-related um, issues. So they're another uh, primary actor in this ecosystem. I is, is it appropriate? Uh, I think the Canadian government has made very clear they want to have a very light touch unless there's an issue. So it behooves both the CRTC, which truly is a government entity and actors like us, uh, as well as the industry players to find that right balance that creates representation for civil society, but is also pragmatic and realistic in terms of 
a relatively thinly populated, extremely large country, uh, which has a relatively hostile climate um, and, and thinly populated along the uh, southern border of it. So those are some of the practical realities that play into allowing in, you know, making pragmatic decisions for industry while maintaining the interests of civil society and the general population. And I think right now we have a fair balance, but it is a balance that's constantly in flux. And we've seen that as recently as this week where a new chairman of the CRTC, the government agency for broadcast and telco, has come in and started to take a very different position, a very, very consumer focused, uh, um, civil society is probably not the right word, but average consumer, average member of the population focus versus previous decisions which have been very industry centric. So right now we're going through a rebalancing of that and we as CIRA play a significant role as a neutral, independent, expert member of the ecosystem. Okay, th thanks, Byron. Um, I think I'll ask uh, um, Carlos Afonso to uh, talk from uh, from the perspective of Brazil. Uh, it's interesting because some of the policies and criteria used by CIRA in Canada are similar to the ones we use in Brazil. One of them, which is crucial and has been since we uh, CGI.br was founded in, I am hearing myself, <laughs> with an echo, strange. <laughs> uh, since CGI.br was founded in 1995, uh, that uh, the CCTLD belongs, is, is a common good, is, is an asset of the commons. And uh, like in Canada, I am a Canadian citizen as well, and I have my .ca, and uh, I know that I have to prove that I am a Canadian citizen in order to get it. And uh, the same for Brazil. .br is for Brazilians, is regarded as the identity of Brazil on the internet. And uh, this since the beginning. And how was this process? I'll be a bit quick on this. Uh, uh, started actually with ECO 92, the conference, the UN conference on environment and development, and uh, uh, in which we finally managed to bring uh, permanent internet links to Brazil uh, uh, as part of a project to provide internet in the spaces of the conference. And this was against a situation in which we had a state monopoly of telecommunications who not only stuck to the IOS SOOSI model, but also uh, determined that it was illegal to operate under any other protocol, any kind of uh, telecommunication in Brazil. But we managed to, uh, with, uh, it was a, a, a group of uh, NGOs and researchers, academic community, and oh, some members of government at the time, especially from the Ministry of Science and Technology, who <coughs> understood the importance of the internet and supported very strongly the Eco 92 project because it ena would enable those two links, one in Sao Paulo and the other in Rio with the United States. And they became permanent, effectively. And from there, we built the idea of having a sort of governance mechanism. We di didn't use that expression at the time. Coordinating mechanism we used uh, to manage that asset, the .br, and manage the associated elements, like the distribution of IP addresses in the country, which also is considered an asset of the commons. And Brazil is today, for the ones that know this terminology, an NIR is a National Internet uh, Registry. It, it's CGI.br, actually NIC.br, the operating arm of uh, CGI.br, that uh, distributes IP addresses in Brazil. And in 1995, we managed the government to do two, two things. First, to agree to the creation of this commission, which was uh, tripartite, 
participation of government, academic sector, civil society, actually four, uh, and the private sector. Uh, and uh, the non-government members at the time were nominated by the government, were not chosen by their own communities. But we managed also to approve a very important decree which determined, it's called uh, decree number four uh, in 1995, <coughs> in May 1995, which determined that the internet, say, the internet layer, the transport layer, the application layer were all value-added services and therefore were not, no, did not belong to the realm of telecommunications, were beyond the reach of the telecom regulator. No? And uh, this norm stands until today. Uh, and uh, therefore, the current regulator, which was fund, uh, founded in 1997, if I remember right, uh, especially to prepare for the privatization of telecommunications at the time, which happened between 97 and 98, uh, until today, does not touch the internet in any way in those three layers. No? And uh, uh, then, well, this process was, uh, Okay, CGI.pr started to work. We organ organized ourselves to start charging for domain names in order to maintain the operation. Our structure is similar to Siri in that we operate our DNS servers. We also s uh, have mirrors fr for DNS servers of other NICs no, uh, throughout the world and have our own mirrors in abroad as well. And uh, uh, a major change came in when a, a progressive government led by Lula in 2000, was elected in 2002, uh, decided that uh, all the mem non-government members should be chosen by their own constituencies in, a, in an electoral process which was open and transparent. And this was a major change which consolidated CGI.br as a multi-stakeholder organization. I don't want to extend much because in the debate we can discuss what uh, will happen afterwards, okay? Okay, thank, thank you. Uh, <coughs> Susan, do you want to? Thank you. Uh, Susan. 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 Um, as I had said before, my name is uh, Susan Chalmers and I am the policy lead for Internet NZ, Internet New Zealand. Uh, so I'll just begin by giving a brief description of um, what Internet NZ is and who we are and what we do. Um, Internet NZ is recognized uh, by ICANN as the, the manager of the .NZ domain name space. So um, we have two subsidiary companies, the Domain Name Commission and New Zealand Registry Services that handle the day-to-day -day functions of um, management of .NZ. So uh, DNC, the Domain Name Commission, um, they handle all the domain name policy um, and they authorize registrars um, and deal with uh, domain name disputes while NZRS is the registry service. Um, Internet NZ, um, what we focus on is uh, developing um, policy that protects and promotes the internet in New Zealand for New Zealanders. Um, so as uh, Byron had mentioned that um, Canada has a very light touch uh, regulation of the CCTLD. I guess you could say that in that case, New Zealand has a super light touch um, because the delegation uh, does not flow through um, the government. We actually have an exchange of letters with ICANN um, where to operate um, the domain name space. So uh, we have a tremendously wonderful relationship uh, with the government, but that delegation did not flow through them. Um, so I think some of the guiding principles behind Internet and NZ and what we do, um, well, a lot of them stem from RFC 1591, which obligates all CCTLD managers to operate within the best interests of the Internet community. So also like .ca, our, um, our council, our version of the board of directors, is elected by our membership 
and we have an open membership policy. So anybody can join Internet and Z and participate um, in that process. And so we kind of view ourselves, I guess you could say, as a, the custodians of the Internet in New Zealand. And so we have a positive uh, obligation to respond to the Internet community. Um, and a bit about our, um, our policy development process. So for Internet NZ, now Internet NZ used to, before about two years ago, we had a very kind of narrow ambit, mainly we were promulgating policy. Um, it was only with respect to certain issues, largely technical issues, um, and also uh, broadband issues, competition issues. In the past two years, Internet NZ has more or less wide, widened its ambit of what we focus on. So I, for example, do um, a lot of work in the area of copyright law and the Internet. Um, I also were contributing, um, we've been consulted by the government on the ITRs, um, and we're putting some work into the new GTLD process. So the ambit's really kind of um, widened beyond that. And uh, so I, I'd be happy to talk a little bit more about um, how Internet NZ interacts with the community and um, other organizations when we start discussing those okay. mechanisms. Thanks, Susan. Uh, Pranesh. Pranesh Prakash. I work uh, as a policy director at the Center for Internet and Society. Right at the beginning, I'd like to uh, reiterate something that uh, that Parminder said yesterday during uh, the discussion on enhanced cooperation. That a lot of our discussions around uh, internet governance. Uh, tend to center sometimes around ICANN and around uh, uh, around critical internet uh, resources, and traditionally that's been the case. Of course, uh, if we uh, see the development since, uh, especially since WISIS, uh, we see that it's it's been broadened quite a bit. And right now, uh, uh, right now, we st uh, we do see that policy-related issues dominate uh, public airwaves, but at the heart of it remains uh, internet resources uh, like names and numbers. And that's the only part of the internet that in a sense isn't truly decentralized. And there is no technical reason that it can't be decentralized. Uh, there have been attempts through the years uh, to achieve such decentralization, which just haven't gotten enough public support. So to answer the question of how should the national commons of internet resources be managed, uh, for me those commons exist at multiple levels, so there can't be any one answer to that question. And I'd also like to echo the words of uh, Andrea Glorioso from the European Commission who uh, in uh, Sharm El Sheikh during a wonderful panel put together, uh, I think it was Sharm El Sheikh or uh, maybe at Vilnius, in a wonderful panel put together by Milton Mueller, made a great point about how even supposedly technical things, uh, and at that time they were discussing uh, DNS security, how even such su supposedly technical things are in fact extremely political, and it isn't really reasonable uh, at one level for the technical community to be so hostile to, uh, to uh, not political interference but to, uh, to the fact that these technical activities can be political as well. And it is unfortunate that that isn't seen. So, uh, so that's just one, one very broad point I'd like to make right at the beginning. In terms of how things are managed in India, well, uh, there's the National Internet Exchange of India, which is a private corporation 
uh, that was formed by, uh, uh, that's a private corporation uh, that was uh, in fact created by the government of India in 2003. Now, uh, the National Internet Exchange also runs the .in registry, uh, which was a governmental function earlier uh, run by the National Center for Software Technology and for the Center for Development of Advanced Computing. And this changed uh, in 2005. However, most of a lot of the work at Nixie is outsourced to companies such as Aphelios. And uh, there is no real, uh, and, and while there are industry members, uh, there is no real uh, public uh, participation in, in processes. There are individual uh, uh, tracks in Nixie for which, uh, for which the public participates. For instance, while handing out uh, grants from Nixie, Parminder uh, was a part of that process. Uh, and other uh, people in the internet sphere are called on for spe certain specific tasks, but there is no process for that. And this was quite clearly seen uh, during the uh, during the process of Nixie becoming the National Internet Registry as well. Uh, the decision making for that was not completely opaque, because there are we can see the exchange between the Telecom Regulatory Authority of India, the Department of Telecom etc. And, and we can see that decision being formed, but there was no public participation in that decision. Uh, and that was one of the, one of the main uh, issues at contention, uh, that Nixie being seen as a government body, not being truly independent of the government, uh, whether it's appropriate for it to be the National Internet Registry. What kinds of mechanisms are, are proper? Uh, well, I don't really uh, know for, uh, and sorry, just to, to reiterate the question, what kind of me mechanisms are proper for those situations where there's a mix of both technical and social and larger public policy issues? Well, the fact is at the national level, we can, we can look at certain things, but at the international level itself, this is an issue that's been going on that, uh, since at least 1993, when the Internet Law and Policy Forum, uh, at that point of time, it was the Internet Law Task Force, was formed uh, as a private body. And subsequently, in, in 97, there was uh, ISOC formed a project called the Internet Social Task Force uh, as a complement to the IETF and the Internet Research Task Force. Right. These efforts have, of course, fizzled out uh, in the 2000s. Uh, Visis came into being, lots of these issues were, were taken up in that process instead. Uh, I don't have real answers to this, and I guess that will come out through the, through the discussion. Uh, but these are just some issues I wanted to raise uh, right at the beginning for the situation in India. And in terms of what we can do, uh, since Mike is indicating at me, so I'll, I'll save uh, uh, the issue of surplus, uh, surplus funds for, for a bit later in the discussion. Okay. Uh, thanks, Pranesh. Um, uh, Tapio uh, from Finland. Tapani, you correct it. Yeah, I know Finnish names are impossible. Uh, perhaps I, I should reintroduce myself for just that reason. Tapani Pradvain, and I'm representing here Electronic Frontier Finland, uh, which is an NGO that has not all that close ties to the issues at hand. I was drafted here at a very short notice, and I only saw the questions the moderator posed at the beginning of the session, so I'm um, apologies for not having a very well-prepared speech. But I've been in the, so to speak, in the Finnish internet policies for a long time. Internet came to Finland from universities where I work, and I've seen how it evolved. Uh, there's a brief description of how the DNS regulation works. There's a Finnish Communications Regulatory Authority, which is a proper government agency, which runs the .fi registry. So in that sense, the government has mm, less light-handed approach than Canadian and New Zealand, but in practice, it is rather independent and does not run any very heavy-handed approach anywhere. 
as in Brazil, that FI has is reserved for Finns. In a sense, you have to have be a Finnish citizen or have some kind of presence there. Of course, corporations can simply establish a branch in Finland to do that. If you look at dot .i i.fi for example it has nothing to do with Finland except it sounds good for them so they established a branch in Finland for that and, uh, while this regulatory authority figure is a, a government agency Finland is a small country and people in these circles know each other and there are lots of informal communications across so whenever they set up new policies like which character sets to use allowed in the IDNs, which is not an obvious thing. Finnish is written in Latin alphabet with a, a number of extra characters. And besides Finnish, there is Swedish speaking, spoken, and a number of three different Sami languages which have characters of their own. So they circulate, ask opinions for everybody who really cares. It, it's they do take into, into account. You ask how this should be managed, the Finnish system is, it sounds a bit fishy actually when you try to you describe it like that, that the government or agency runs things and then talks to others. So, well, yeah, formally it's not really a nice setup, but in practice it works well enough so far. And so you are talking about commons of internet resources, that's a rather wide subject what all that encompasses that besides the pure domain name system and if you think about what all the IGF handles it's all kinds of things you may notice that the Finnish represent government people in the IGF are actually from the foreign ministry possibly sometimes there have been some from the Ministry of Transport and Communications and the uh, various issues move between these number of ways in the WISIS process and uh, also it was the foreign ministry who drafted the civil society members including me to participate there and uh, there's been a informal working task group or working group in from my run by the ministry of for the foreign ministry that includes members from all over a few other ministries from NGOs like Electronic Frontier Finland, so I've been there, uh, from companies like Nokia and so on, and organized also the Finnish Internet Forum in the past few years. Um, looking at the other questions, you know, how to ensure meaningful participation of all stakeholders as well, it's been like just invite everybody in and see who turns up. And Finland is small enough that usually everybody who wants to be involved can. Um, okay, one p final question you have, how the surplus from domain name registration fees should be used and the uh, Finnish communications regulatory authority has been basically dropping fees whenever they run, have extra money so far, which is reasonable approach enough if you ask me. But I guess I'll leave it at that for now. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, just, um, um, sorry? Oh yeah, okay. That's um, so. We've just been joined by David Souter, who is the author of the ISOC reports that I was referring to. And uh, perhaps David, if you want to um, give a brief introduction to those reports, um, I'll give you a couple minutes to uh, to gather your thoughts. Uh, is there anyone else here who wants to um, uh, wants to? talk about a specific national experience. Uh, you want to talk about, okay. Uh, anyone else here wants to talk about a specific, uh, uh, not about a general issues, but a specific national experience with, uh, with uh, uh, in a national gov uh, internet governance mechanism. And you're from, sorry? Ukraine, okay. So you're from India and the Ukraine. Okay, so we'll have, uh, if you could each uh, sort of from Ukraine first, okay, and then from India. Uh, thank you very much, Oksana Prihodka, European Media Platform, uh, Eurala Secretary. Um, 
Um, it was very interesting for me to hear about light touch, uh, super light touch, but I would like to raise the issue uh, governmental touch. But uh, uh, I'm interested in situation with governmental vacuum. Uh, for example, just now during uh, this uh, IGF, we cannot uh, receive uh, any official position of Ukrainian uh, government uh, on ITU issues, on uh, CCTLD issues, on IDN issues, and it's great uh, concern for us. And uh, I know that uh, I can, for example, I can have some binding mechanisms, but for example, I can have no status of uh, um, international organization. And that is why Ukrainian government, for example, can uh, say that uh, we don't know about such organization at all. Uh, there is no um, such organization in our official lists, mm. uh, governmental lists, and that is why we uh, we uh, not uh, must to be presented in such organizations. And of course, IGF also has no binding mechanisms. But uh, I would like uh, to discuss the role of international organizations with such binding mechanisms. Council of Europe, for example, uh, Ukraine is a member of this organization, European Union. Ukraine is not the member of this organization, but uh, we uh, try uh, to join this organization. And it would be interesting for me to know um, are there any mechanism of coordination uh, of uh, such standards, minimal standards, with such international organizations? Thank you. Uh, it's very interesting. So what you're, you're, you're presenting a challenge to the community of uh, national internet governance to develop some standards and a uh, mechanism which would support your uh, issues in, in the Ukraine. Thank you. That's very good. Thank you. And introduce Hi. yourself, please. Um, yeah, am I audible? Uh, very. Uh, Hi. <laughs> thank you for having me. Yeah? Okay. So, because I can't really hear myself. I know, I well, know. Um, my name is Subhi Chaturvedi, and I come from India. I represent uh, both academia and civil society in my small capacity. I teach communication and new media studies in India, and I represent Media for Change. But largely, I wanted to make an intervention because I was recently part of the MAG that put together the India Internet Governance Conference. Um, well, we did hope to create a similar platform like the IGF by any other name. That was really our attempt to make it more multi stakeholder. Pranesh gave you a small introduction and an insight into how internet and debates around the internet governance happen, but um, you uh, in your initial um, notes mentioned that there are some countries which are less developed as far as the governance debate is concerned. Well, uh, we've had a lot of success as far as telecom is concerned, but as far as internet is concerned, we seriously have a long way to go. In terms of governance and conversations with the government, we're only just getting started. So we, we did see this conference as a huge step for forward because for the first time we were able to engage with multi-stakeholders from all sections, academia, civil society, industry was represented. But my, my concern really is, and which is why I'd like this gentleman from CIRA to intervene at this point, because in India, uh, governing the internet has been a bit of a challenge because you have three separate government departments that um, formulate regulations as far as the internet is concerned. Uh, you have the Ministry of External Affairs, you have uh, telecom, you also have a lot of other representation. Um, so in terms of getting a clarity, if there is a situation or an emergency situation, or even in terms of ITRs per se, uh, academia and civil society really had to struggle to get the first draft out. And we actually needed the industry to facilitate our interventions around the Indian government's official position on ITRs. So, um, we've been able to come together, but only in disparate processes. So how has CIRA and um, I think it is CERT, which uh, C, uh, which is uh, managed to uh, find this balance in Canada. That is one learning process that um, would be great if we could share that. And um, I completely agree in terms of light touch and super light touch. We're talking about ideal um, utopian scenarios, but in terms of just finding platforms and voices to reach out to the government, because we know that one day we're invited and we're in the room. Um, for ITU, we don't even know uh, if we'll be able to make it to the wicked platforms. 
So if public advocacy could come together and create enabling platforms, especially for academia and civil society who are often not very well funded, so the question of surplus, um, that's, that's one huge intervention, especially for developing nations. So I wanted to share the India story and also put this across on the table. Thank you. Uh, before, we g before we go to uh, uh, Byron to uh, respond, and to Parminder for his intervention. I'd like to ask David Souter to just briefly introduce the, the work that ISOC has been doing in this area. Um, hello, um, and my apologies for not having been here in the earlier part of the session, so I don't know how what I might say will fit into that. Uh, Parminder asked me this morning if I could come along and explain the new um, ISOC framework for assessing national ICT um, uh, environments, which I've developed for them uh, earlier this year and which we've just launched. Um, and so I'll try to take five minutes to do that maximum. Okay. Um, uh, essentially, it's, a, it's, it's built around um, a feeling that too little attention was being paid to the national level of internet governance and that if we were fully to understand what was going on at a global level, a regional level, or, and an, or a national level, we needed to have a, a deeper understanding of the diversity of national experiences. Um, so the national assessment framework is based on uh, taking three fundamental factors within internet governance at national level, the issues with which people are concerned in the internet governance debate, the stakeholders who are participating, and at least as important as that, I think, the stakeholders who are not participating at a national level, and the decision-making processes within the country. Um, uh, so we've developed that, uh, this particular framework, and we've done a pilot study of Kenya, which is also launched today. Um, the framework takes those three elements, and it seeks to, to develop maps for them, which can be overlaid across one another. Uh, in order to, to build a kind of pictorial image of, uh, of the national environment, which helps to elucidate the textual analysis. Um, and the textual analysis is based on a methodology which is pretty familiar to any um, researcher, I think, of a uh, combination of desk research, interviews and focus groups, observation of the national IGF, and, um, uh, uh, and uh, a questionnaire uh, model. Um, but in terms of the analysis of those three different elements, um, what we do in the issues areas, we divide issues into four broad uh, groups, um, two technical groups, which are standardization and co coordination, um, infrastructure, which is a separate group, which is essentially to do with the relationship with the between the internet and the underlying communications infrastructure, uh, or the telecommunications sector, and public policy issues, which are um, in an old definition, if you like, broad internet governance, those issues in which the internet bodies themselves are not primarily responsible. It's not, of course, uh, for groups, it's a continuum, and that continuum is mapped diagrammatically in a way that I'm not able to show you on a, because it, we, we can't do slides, but, but which you, if you uh, look at the report on the ISOC website, you'll, you'll see. Um, another way of doing that kind of issue mapping is to a mind map exercise, um, which is uh, as an alternative, which uh, some of you may know I developed for the uh, for APC and other organizations a couple of years back. Uh, so that's the issue side of it. In the uh, stakeholder communities, we divided that into essentially five groupings, two of which have international uh, spin-offs. So, and those groupings being first, government agencies. Uh, second, the private sector, in which we um, attached as much importance to the demand side, that is users, as to the supply side, that is businesses that supply the internet. Um, civil society, meaning all other organizational entities which are not profit-making or government. Uh, the internet technical and professional community, which overlaps both with the private sector and with civil society. Um, and users who are not properly uh, recognized in the view of this model within a, a civil society model, but are, but are actually separate. Users being um, both citizens and consumers, that is the same people in two different uh, formulations uh, and the international organizations stemming on the off that intergovernmental and, and the internet international bodies. Um, in terms of decision making for uh, that's on the whole uh, more straightforward at, a, at the national level you can identify some fairly clearly which are within the internet however um, there are also important decision making entities at a national level which are not as well recognized and those include government departments which are public service departments which are major users of the internet uh, and therefore um, because of their significance in the society and also their significance in the market for certain internet services are quite powerful players um, and also actually that we felt that there's an underestimation of the importance of telecoms businesses as decision-making entities within the internet environment at a national level 
um, and I won't talk about the case study of Kenya, um, but others, others could do that. Uh, but essentially, it found a, a strong internet governance environment there, but one in which, and here's the one point I would draw attention to, there were significant gaps in participation, um, including the demand side of business, but especially, and I think most interestingly, including the small SMEs, small, small and medium-sized enterprises in the ICT sector. So the young entrepreneurs who are the next generation of the internet um, leadership, if you like, were not actively engaged in internet governance, and nor were other others who were highly dependent on it, such as cyber cafe owners and managers. Um, and that was a loss. So. Thank you very much, David. That's, um, I, and your, the reports are available on the ISOC website? They're available now, are they? Okay, good. Uh, anybody else have a national experience they want to? Yeah, okay. Uh, yes, go ahead. Over there. Uh, thanks, Pamin, um, Chair. Um, uh, my name is Ben Ako. I work for, I'm an associate with the International Institute for Sustainable Development. Um, we've been working in a number of countries in West Africa for a while now, uh, trying to build uh, a local capacity for internet public policy. Uh, our intentions were pretty much to move beyond the dialogue only phase to uh, trying to apply that in development sector, uh, specifically uh, pointing towards uh, steps that can be taken towards uh, meeting some development objectives. Uh, we had implemented uh, a series of steps uh, and it took about two years to study uh, Togo uh, as a small West African country, very small, but um, when we stepped into the country there was practically no uh, public forum uh, and we wanted to build the capacity of a few people that we had met there that were interested in uh, bringing together multi-stakeholders, which was not the traditional form of multi-stakeholder partnership that we know it to be. Um, we wanted to see beyond the technical community, and so we brought other uh, civil society actors into the place using a series of steps similar to what David had mentioned for, uh, 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 for Kenya. We put together some questionnaires just to elicit uh, what the core internet uh, 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 s uh, development issues were in the country, um, and also gathered a number of focus groups uh, in which we brought participants together to address m some of the critical issues that they thought were important for them. Um, and uh, finally, we ran a series of uh, what we call future scenarios exercises where we thought that they could identify where they would like to be at a few years from now and, and fi identify steps that could take them to, those, uh, uh, to that future. Um, at the end of it, we, it was important to, to state that uh, a couple of very important things were identified, uh, one of which was uh, the gaps that existed between uh, the universities in building capacity for the industry. So for instance, Togo's uh, phosphate industry was very uh, vibrant, but there were no gaps, uh, so there were existing gaps that uh, resulted uh, as a f uh, because there were no uh, education uh, programs that were put in place to meet uh, you know, the development of expertise and skills to fill those positions. That's, so that was very clear. Uh, secondly, education itself had uh, some challenges. That Togo, for it to be sustainable, uh, requiring its internet um, as a, a medium or a tool to enable uh, its economy, needed to have very strong education programs put in place which uh, was very evident from that research. Um, a third component that came out actually was that there was a, uh, a gap in the culture of uh, uh, community that the internet had sort of come around to disrupt. Um, and, and so uh, the reason why it hasn't had the uptake that it's supposed to have was because uh, parents and uh, uh, religious leaders thought that uh, the internet opened avenues to immoral uh, uh, lives that, uh, habits that contradicted their, their local culture and tradition. And so there was a lot of capacity building and awareness issues that had to be taken care of for the internet to address the social challenges that the country faced. 
Um, this was an example where we looked at a number of, uh, you know, we just used a number of tools, met with a few people within the communities, uh, ran through some uh, scenarios, and produced things that were not internet-based specifically, but touched on the economic development of the country. Thanks, Ben, and good to meet you finally. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, uh, Nena, did you want to talk about a specific experience? I guess um, what I wanted to do is just get, get a, a range of specific experiences out, which I think we've done. Did you have a specific experience then, Nena? Go ahead. Yes. Good afternoon. My name is Nena, and I live in Cote d'Ivoire. I wanted to share ex the experience of the use of internet by citizens. Um, Cote d'Ivoire is a country made up of about 70% of youth. And two, t two years ago, we had a civil war. And the internet was used before, during, and after the crisis. And the use of the internet during the crisis, this crisis was after an election, had given rise to a greater internet aware community and the government has also come to understand that when the internet is used by citizens it has a greater influence over policy over business and especially for humanitarian services we have some of that documented and i'll be glad to share with anyone furthermore um, but what the experience I would like to share with you is what we call in Cote d'Ivoire web utile. That is the internet that saves lives. The internet for humanitarian purposes. And the that has brought us together, the government, the civil society, the blogger community, and um, surprisingly, the telcos to come together and look at the way internet builds peace. So we are, we are in the process of using the internet as a peace building mechanism. So it is easier for government to come around the table because we all understand that peace in a country that comes from war is de it's economic development, it's agricultural development, it's national reconciliation, and that has been the stock of our discussions during our national IGF, which took place about three weeks ago. Um, so my, my point here is that it was taken over by the, so the, civil, the citizenship, not necessarily what we call civil society today. And right now, um, we have come to the stage where we are drafting a user's charter, a charter for internet users in the country so that internet will be a building block for peace in that country. It wasn't imposed by government, it was not suggested by the regulatory agency, but it is citizens themselves who put up an internet users association and said we need to set up documentation in place that will help other people when in other places know how to make the best of internet as a build, uh, as peace building tool. Okay, thanks, Nana. Um, uh, okay, uh, Parminder had his hand up. Uh, you had your hand up, um, and there was a question there. And so, um, Parminder, do you want to talk, and then Byron to answer her question, and then we'll start opening the discussion up. Okay, thank you, Mike. Am I audible? Yes. Uh, yeah, w I think it was a uh, very interesting discussion and the kind of models we heard not only from the panelists but also like the one which Nana gave now gives us a very good basis of building how a national mechanism gets built. I see it in two or three categories. Uh, I think, yes, that's the problem of not being able to figure out how loud it is. Okay, thank you, uh, Mike. I think there, uh, we can see things in two or three categories. Yeah, uh, one 
which we have discussed a lot is about the critical internet resource management systems at the national level and we heard a lot about it and then there are general public policy issues which connect with the critical internet resources or may not connect that much and within these public policy issues there are ones which are convergent and there are others which are located in different ministries and we have to see how they, they can coordinate and on the citizen side there is to be a participative mechanism uh, some national IGFs have come up uh, in uh, Brazil there is no national IGF but uh, the dot uh, CGI dot BR itself goes around and does a lot of consultations so these are some kind of institutionalized consultation mechanisms which could be form of national IGFs so we need to be able to figure out which system um, fits best for all or three or four things. So I, I, I just thought categorization of things in this manner uh, is helpful and we are getting a lot of uh, inputs and we'll probably try to also map uh, what fits where. Uh, Mike, who's next? Well, I'll try to, uh, I'll try to answer the question as best I can. Um, I, I was slightly taken aback when uh, the Canadian Internet Governance Model was, was called utopian. I think that's definitely the first time I've ever heard that, but um, I guess the, the grass is always greener. Uh, to me, I spoke about uh, balance and the balance between the broadband and broadcast regulating agency, which is not us, a and us as a private corporation that operates the, the .ca. You know, there, there are other actors, and in terms of trying to find that balance, uh, there are a few things, and remember, this has also been over a decade in the making, and uh, as much as I think there are good elements to it, I, I'm not sure I'd classify it as utopian, but it, it has its moments. But there are things that we've introduced along the way that have helped find that balance. Uh, one thing is a broad multi-stakeholder board, which I, I'll tell you practically, as a CEO, is an incredible challenge to work with, but at the end of the day, hopefully brings about a better final result. But the practical element is very challenging. On that board, we have a, a Government of Canada representative. And again, it's the small details that I think make a difference. Uh, she's non-voting, but she is a board member. Some of you may know her, it's Heather Dryden, who also happens to be chair of the GAC. Uh, and she gives us some time when she can. But that way the government knows what's going on inside CIRA, knows what's happening at the national TLD level and the governance activities that we're engaged in much more broadly. And since the government is the actual, uh, re has received the actual delegation and then passed it through to us, at the end of the day, they also know they have that big red button that they can press. If they really don't like what we're doing, they can redelegate. Now, that, of course, is a nuclear option, um, which takes me to my next point about balance. In our part of the ecosystem, if you just run it really well, in Canada, the government leaves you alone. We're a good news story. And by being legitimate because we do what we do well, we stick to our knitting and do that well, we have a lot of bandwidth or, or, or a lot of room for maneuver in the activities that we engage in. And I think that's another one of the key elements of balance that allows the CCTLD to do things other than just run the registry that are beneficial to the internet community. Uh, we try to be a good citizen. We do things other than just running DNS and registry. We, uh, we sponsor and run a Canadian internet forum where we do everything we can to bring many, many different actors uh, to the forum, both physically and online. And we also bring very senior government folks to that uh, environment, uh, which is actually really interesting to see because it's very rare, truly at the national level, where very senior bureaucrats and political actors actually have to face the general public and listen to the general public. And it's very rare where the general public gets to ask senior political and bureaucratic actors direct questions. So, you know, the corporate structure and how you balance that makes a good, uh, makes a significant difference. Just being good at what you do gives you the legitimacy to then do other things that are to the benefit of the broader ecosystem, like running an internet forum. 
So those are some of the things that we try to do in Canada that give us the balance to act the way we do. Yes, we, we call it the Canadian Internet Forum, the CIF. Uh, we've run it for two years and uh, in February. So if anybody wants to come to Canada in February, uh, you're welcome to do that. Uh, we'll be running our third one this February. And we, we report on that and have a fairly detailed report, which is online and available at our website, which is cira.ca. Uh, Susan, I think you were first. Okay. You are sure? Okay. Uh, okay. As, as Byron was saying, we also have certain uh, uneasiness sometimes with the way in which the multi-stakeholder process is carried out in, in CGI.br. As I said, we are a commission created by the government, uh, by decree. This decree is very frail. The government could change it at any time. And uh, it, it, it's not sustained by a law. You know? If it were, it would be much more consolidated. And uh, we have many more members of the government in the, in the board. We have not, uh, eight members plus one which represents the secretariats of state of the different provinces, which in Brazil are called states. And we have uh, 21 members in total, so 11 members from civil society. There is a thin major majority. And on certain issues, the government has a leverage, very strong leverage sometimes, so it's not very easy. Even with that, we managed to do a lot because the, the domain name uh, operation generates a very significant surplus. So all this operation, the entire operation is run on a self-sufficient basis. And the, the federal tribunal has declared that uh, we, uh, uh, the income generated by the operation is private funds, has nothing to do, is not public funds. The government has no, uh, no say about it. And uh, with that, we manage as well to, to, for instance, to run the national network of IXPs. We have about 20 IXPs running today, neutral ISPs, non-profits, and uh, several other projects like uh, Center, Center for Research on Statistics of the Internet, uh, the Security Center, and many others. No? We run a, 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 an office of W3C and support it, and we have written the 10 principles for the governance and use of the internet in Brazil, which were quoted by, by oh, I forgot her name, the American word. Fiona yes. Alexander. Yes, yes. And uh, uh, this was the basis for, it, it was a two year process, exactly because this multi-stakeholder process in our case is not simple, but we managed to have that by consensus, including telcos, everybody. And uh, it was the basis also for the proposal of the civil rights framework for the internet, which is right now going to Congress as a sort of quotation marks, constitution of the internet in Brazil, which we want to, to have approved as, as a reference for any law or decree reg related to the internet that comes along. I want to ask a question. I'm sorry, Susan, but uh, as a fan of uh, .cgi, um, I wonder how you define the public interest, that is, as, a, as an agency that's very active in support of the public interest, mm -hmm. uh, both self-consciously and I would say uh, uh, quite uh, directly. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you define the public interest from, from the .cgi perspective, .br perspective? I think we don't have a, 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 a sorry, sorry, I don't hear. Uh, we don't define it, we do it, we try to do it, no? And uh, the way we do it is exactly through this, this process, which we, we, the priority in using those excess funds is in uh, what we call structuring projects. We know that we have plenty of funds, but they are very little compared to the size and scope and challenges of Brazil. So we try to focus, for instance, on providing infrastructure, like the IXPs in trying to provide very good research on what is going on on the internet in Brazil. And it's now a UNESCO 
organiz uh, associated organization, which is setic.br, and uh, several other projects like that. We also uh, support several events related to internet governance and ICTs in Brazil, and a national forum on, on internet, which is the also our IGF started last year. We run it a second time this year. And we are open for projects proposed by, by society, projects related to internet development in, in several fields. So this is the way we try to carry out what uh, you said, the public interest. Okay. No? Susan? Thank you. Um, I just wanted to comment on what I see as a few emerging themes here um, amongst the panelists. So um, in terms of National IGF's Internet NZ has what's called a net hui, and hui is a Maori word for uh, meeting. And um, we've had two net hui's so far. Our first net hui ed was we had a couple hundred people, which is pretty big for New Zealand because we actually have, I think, an order of magnitude more sheep than people <laughs> in the country. It's uh, about 4.64 million people in New Zealand. Um, and and so our, and our second one was even uh, we generated even uh, larger interest and we subsidized uh, attendance of the IGF so that um, most people would be able to afford it. So over three days, I think it was like forty-five dollars, including lunch. So um, so that was really really an important part for us when we're talking about the multi-stakeholder. Um, the multi-stakeholder model because even though most of our policy, well at least when I work on policy positions, they are greatly informed by the views of our members. We believe that it's important to reach out to the wider community and to try and involve them in the discussion. Um, also I wanted to offer a comment on balance. So in terms of, of balance, so Internet NZ is a, a, a not-for-profit charitable we're a registr registered charitable institution. We're, we're a private organization. Um, our income is derived from um, the price that we charge uh, registrars um, for having domain names, and that's at $1.25 per month. Um, so, and we were talking about use of funds and appropriate use of funds. So, first, there's, I mean, we're sub. We're subject not only to the laws of uh, New Zealand, but also to that of public opinion. And um, one thing that I've learned in that I've been in New Zealand for two years is that um, Kiwis really like a fair go. And and so we do, we we are subject to a lot of scrutiny in the press, um, and we operate under the constraints of not only the laws, but the public opinion. And, and so to that extent, we aim to be um, as inclusive as possible and the domain name commission always has broad public consultations in developing any change when it comes to uh, domain name policy. Susan, can I uh, yeah. um, uh, just uh, one of the uh, as to follow a uh, follow up question, one of the things that intrigues me about uh, Internet New Zealand was the intervention that uh, was made in the uh, New Zealand digital strategy, which was one of the I mean, it may have been before your time, but it was one of the initial uh, national uh, strategies for internet development in a, on, a, on a very broad basis, including, uh, it was a mul very multi-stakeholder uh, um, uh, process uh, that really defined government policy for, for a period of time. And I, I think, as I understand it, uh, Internet New Zealand was a very active proponent of that, in fact, may have been the one of the most important proponents in that. That was actually before, before your time. time. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. <but laughs> it sounds like something we do. Uh, well, well it was um, it, you did, and it was very yeah. important. Maybe somebody over there. Did you want to comment? Yeah. Uh, somebody's somebody's nodding. I think it's I think it's important uh, because I think it's it is an extension of the notion of what it means to represent the pu the public interest yeah. and public good. And uh, perhaps you could. Introduce yourself and come. Speaking about the New Zealand thing. Yeah. Uh, my name. My name is Marilyn Cade. Yeah. 
And um, Susan may be surprised to know that I'm a member of Internet NSAID, <laughs> although I'm from the United States. Um, but I'm very familiar with that particular um, intervention, um, not in detail but in general, because I was uh, in New Zealand a number of times uh, interacting with Internet NSAID when they were taking up the consultation with the community on the role that they were going to play. In Internet NSAID, as Susan has said, is really a full service society. And um, it, it does many things that you've mentioned, as well as had the world's first uh, domain name regulator, uh, Debbie Monahan. But the, um, the other thing that I think is really interesting when that I observed from interacting with Internet NSAID and following its work is that it takes very seriously the responsibility of reaching into the community, not only in the telecom um, regulatory area, but in the internet accountability area. And is working also, has activities that also reach some of the Pacific Islands in terms of the, so it's a, it's a, it's kind of hard to define. Uh, it To me, when I look around the um, world at the other entities that exist at a national level. I, I see a lot of similarities between CIRA and between Internet and Z, but I think Internet and Z goes further in, um, in thinking about what it needs to influence both in the country and then also regionally, because Internet and Z is also very active in um, APTLD and ICANN uh, in the Internet um, uh, Governance Forum uh, as well. The uh, involvement in the uh, legal and regulatory area is one that I think has been very, very unique coming out of Internet and Par Partly, I think, because they had the resources to do it, that uh, they were able and, and also the willingness to do that. Uh, yeah, no, I, I sorry. Uh, Could just I, I just have a small okay. question for Carlos. Um, you, um, in your opening remarks, mentioned that the internet for all value-added services and should be kept beyond the realm of uh, telecom regulatory. And since uh, we're very concerned because this is just ahead of the Wicket meeting in Dubai and the ITU, um, Indian civil society and academia in particular have been wondering because Brazil and India have been very close culturally together. So how is it that you've managed to draw lines because the boundaries become increasingly blurred for some backhand regulation when it comes to the internet, openness, uh, privacy, permissionless innovation, and particularly freedom of speech and expression. If you could just comment on that. And before I hand over the mic, uh, Susan, my compliments to you. You're, you're th the NZ is a fantastic model, and there's a lot of learning that we need to do from that. Yeah, Carlos. Thank you. Actually, we are uh, confronting some difficulties there because uh, the some sectors of the government which are more closely related, I would say, to put it mildly, with the telcos, are, are interested in abolishing the so-called norm number four, which I mentioned, which separates the internet from telecommunications regulations. And this is part of the process that they were witnessing internationally of the telco pressure towards inserting parts of the internet no, or layers of the internet into the ITR. And uh, unfortunately, we have an, uh, an agent, uh, uh, an agency, a, regulator, a regulatory agency, which is in charge of telecommunications. The Minister of Communications handles broadcasting, and this agency handles telecommunications. And uh, the position is not clear. They have some open consultations, but they never tell you exactly what they are going to do at the, the wicket. And we are afraid that the, the, the position of the regulator might be similar to Ethnos. You know? And we are not. Sh we are pressing a lot as, as, as committee. The CGIBR has made a declaration very similar to ISOC in favor of keeping the, int the internet off ITRs and so on, and of course preserving our norm number four, which is uh, the same thing. You know? But it, it's it, these are difficult times, including in Brazil, very difficult. Okay, uh, two brief comments from people who have been very patient. Uh, 
And then uh, any other comments? Uh, then I'll wrap up. I, I think we're we started about five minutes late, so we'll finish about five minutes late. We've got about basically ten minutes, seven minutes to go. So you, and then you. Okay, um, I'm Siva Subramanian uh, from uh, ISOC India at Chennai, and uh, these are my own personal remarks. I just want to add to what uh, Pranesh said about uh, the consultative process in India that uh, um, he cited the example of Nixi. And uh, I, uh, there are uh, many examples. I'm making this remark at a point of time when things are looking up. There are some definite signs of uh, a willingness on the part of our government to um, respect the multi-stakeholder process, but I just want to go back a little to the immediate past and uh, say that the consultative process in India has so far been um, in appearance. And um, either the call for consultation has not been made wide enough or because it suited uh, our government to keep certain processes closely held there was always a discl disinclination towards uh, consulting people or disinclination towards uh, the multi-stakeholder process. And where there was indeed a consulta consultation, an announced consultation, the consultation was more in appearance than in reality. I'm making this remark for, for all participants from India to uh, bear in mind uh, in uh, the immediate interactions with government and to insist that any consultation process that we come up with, uh, especially for the Internet Governance Forum or, uh, or for all Internet processes, be truly consultative okay. and that the call for consultation goes wide enough. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, we've had heard a lot from India, uh, perhaps, perhaps anyone else not from India. Uh, I, I don't mean to discriminate against India. It's a, a major portion of the world, <laughs> but uh, I know, I know, I know, I know. And uh, uh, sorry, please go ahead. My name is Naresh Ajwani, <coughs> and I'm a president of CCAOI, that is the Cyber Cafe Association of India, but. The specific example you have requested me, uh, I'm not going to share only for India, but for emerging economies. And while I argue for my case, which is related to infrastructure responsible for taking internet to the bottom of the pyramid, I would like to leave some questions to ponder upon by all of you out here. My problem statement is, in emerging economies like India, 60% of internet usage comes through cyber cafes. That's a public internet kiosks. Infrastructure responsible for taking internet to masses at 20 cent per hour. And in many of the places, it is much lesser than that. However, in last two years, the scenario is changing. 60% has come down to 40%. In India alone, 180,000 cyber cafes have come down to 100,000 cyber cafes. A place where not only w internet was available, a place where assistance was available, a place where whether somebody is educated, not educated, was able to have an advantage of internet, not only lost its prominence, but also where internet was going up in urban, 70% of especially India, which is a rural, the internet went down. While I can argue that quite a few stakeholder, stakeholders, especially from authority side, were responsible for the same. But definitely, many of the stakeholders who promote openness, 
and who are generally known for taking care of bottom of the pyramid never made a note of it. While I realized I was being paid well by my organization, I decided to set up a platform where I could give the free service to them in terms of defending them from legal challenges, from security issues, from fonts, etc. I also went to the extent of submitting an application to a body responsible for internet across the world, that is ICANN, saying that, okay, why not Cyber Cafe be a constituency? While it was being deliberated upon, I found out that few people are interested not to limit internet to ICANN, but take it to United Nations. I don't know whether ever I, could, I can think of any constituency out there because I understand that will be altogether government and only government. I wonder, and these are the questions which all of you need to ponder upon with my request as a case study, as a problem statement, that how much we are doing for the bottom of the pyramid, how much, how we are ensuring that they get some kind of a protection, and especially when we are taking or we are proposing to take internet to United Nations and other places, what will happen to this constituency who's responsible for a next billion of internet users? And let me clarify, they are, while they are a businessman, they are a businessman at the price which I have shared with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I, I perhaps uh, try to sum up a bit. Uh, what I hear here is, is um, um, on the one hand, we have the managers of the internet resource, uh, mostly who are doing it probably quite effectively as managers of the internet resource from developed countries, from New Zealand, from uh, Canada, from Brazil. Uh, on the other hand, we have those who are uh, the users of the internet resource and often in environments where the use of the internet resource is a difficult one. You talked about the uh, cyber cafes. Uh, you talked about um, a situation in Togo. Uh, Nena talked about the situation in, in, uh, in Cote d'Ivoire. And I guess the question then is, how uh, are those balanced? Uh, we don't have those kinds of situations, those, those difficulties in Canada. So the uh, business as usual, an extension from there is, uh, is perhaps the most appropriate, or is, is certainly the, the most obvious way of proceeding. Um, on the other hand, how should internet resources be handled, be managed, so as to enable the kinds of uses and users that you're expressing, that Nen is expressing, that you're talking about, Ben, to, to support that? And then how can those in the developed countries uh, perhaps support those developments and the development of appropriate management structures in the developing countries that would satisfy those kinds of demands? Uh, and I guess also, um, uh, the question to leave with is how much should um, those responsible for the management of internet resources see themselves as not only the custodians of the public trust uh, in the internet, but also the, um, the stewards of the public internet uh, and the proponents of the public internet uh, in the uh, sphere of the infrastructure, uh, in the policy sphere, uh, in the process of enabling citizens and communities and individuals to be more active and participative in the, in the internet. And I think those are challenges. I think those are a series of challenges for the developing, developed countries and for the developing countries. And I think that there's really, uh, uh, there's been an extremely interesting and dynamic discussion and one where a lot of the issues, I, I, I haven't mentioned your issues of, uh, in the Ukraine, which is really a, 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 a another set of issues, which is how to ensure uh, a governance structure that is public, transparent, accountable, uh, that acts in the 
uh, interests of the citizens uh, that engages at the at the uh, the global level. Uh, so I guess what we've got here is a series of uh, of interesting challenges and and uh, and potential opportunities for uh, for um, becoming more proactive in the development of uh, of internet governance mechanisms uh, and in the nature of those internet governance mechanisms. So. Um, I would thank you. Has anyone got any final comments? Parminder, did you want to? Uh, I mean, if anyone wants to make a final comment before I make it, but I just wanted to talk about uh, what do we want to do, go ahead with uh, from this workshop as an organizer of the workshop along with uh, Mike Pranesh uh, and others, uh, what and, and uh, CGIBR of Carlos Afonso's uh, organization. Uh, the kind of things we want to go forward with from this workshop, but uh, is Mike, uh, should I go ahead or is anybody yeah, else here? Yeah. So uh, we just would uh, thank you very much for coming over here and we plan uh, to, and we had some early discussions with Center for Internet Society to uh, build a kind of a best practices uh, or a comparative uh, uh, paper about uh, best practices in different places in different parts of the ecosystem and as I described there is the CIR management part, there is a broader public policy part and there is a public consultations and public participation part which is the IGFs and we'll try to you know lay out the advantages, disadvantages, best practices in each area and I would appeal to the people who have participated today we'll send emails to them as well to give uh, documents which they have and if they don't have documents short notes on the kind of work they have been doing and we'll try to together compile that and we would like to have this dialogue uh, carry on uh, in the IGFs to come. Thank you. And I just add to the list to the, the developmental component because I think that, uh, th that uh, many of the uh, managers of the internet resources um, can see themselves as having a, devel a developmental role in, 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 uh, in enabling the broadest possible use of the internet. So, so thank you very much. Uh, Carlos, did you want to say something? Very quickly, just that uh, we have information in English about CGI.br and NIC.br, the structure we have. If anyone wants to, to us to send it, uh, please check. Uh, you could check with me. My email is very simple: ca at ca sorry ca at scafonso c a f o n s o dot c a. <laughs> It's a very egocentric email. <laughs> <laughs> but not BR. <laughs> I'm uh, Susan at yeah. internetnz.netnz. So okay, so if anyone wants to continue this discussion, I guess the best thing would be to, uh, to um, uh, come over here and give us your email. Give us a card or give us your email, and we'll try to continue the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a great panel. That was okay. Sorry, sorry.